Okay, guys, we're going to continue now with part two, and this shouldn't last but a handful of minutes. Um, so now we're going to shift from understanding financial policies and revenue expenditure, revenue and expenditure forecasts. Um, and we're going to look at uh, other things to consider um, as you determine uh, whether or not it's best to hold the line or you know, to continue with the same services and or um, increase those services. Um, and those are revenue management practices. And, and those include things such as long-term revenue stability um, and uh, revenue policies and optimizing revenues from existing sources, uh, for example, uh, property tax collection. Um, you can optimize revenues from existing existing sources and the, the, the example I have here is property taxes um, because if you can collect your delinquent property taxes more efficiently then um, you can uh, include those funds as your projection for revenues all right uh, same way um, in terms of how you collect other type of revenues from the citizens whether it's trash collection or code enforcement fees and fines and, and those type of things. Um, I think it's important that you need to evaluate the sources uh, from revenue needed for your local community. So uh, one of the things is, you know, evaluating where does your revenue come from? And that's where that article from uh, Texas cities is important. Uh, an easy way to do that is to go to your city's website and look at their annual budget. And most of the time, there's a section in there on revenue and expenditures. And so you get an idea as to where the revenue to operate your local government comes from. Now, each state's going to vary a little bit because the laws are going to be different in terms of, um, you know, how fees are collected and what cities are allowed to do. Um, in the handout regarding uh, Texas cities, um, it talks about how the state of Texas gives local communities uh, a bit of latitude in uh, generating revenue sources um, at the expense of, I think it was their property taxes. Uh, so you really need to understand where does it come from? Where does the money to operate a city come from? And then you can evaluate that in terms of long-term revenue stability. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of what cities rely on may not be uh, a constant, all right? Um, property taxes, for example, are typically based on how much a house is worth. Uh, and so you have an assessor's office, typically a county assessor's office, to evaluate what your home is worth. Uh, and depending on the market, it's either going to be... Uh, it could, in theory, be less than what it was a year prior, or it could be more than what it year what it was a year prior, based on uh, real estate economy. Uh, right now, in a lot of urban areas, uh, prices are going through the roof because um, demand for housing uh, exceeds the number of housing units, and so when that typically happens, you begin to see. Uh, prices of existing houses go higher and then but it also impacts people who rent because your rent becomes higher and so sometimes your people are um, forced out of uh, a place they've been renting for a long time because all of a sudden now that rents are going up you can no longer afford that a lot of states and cities are beginning to address this through uh, rent control uh, california uh, city of portland oregon for example uh, they're all beginning to look at how to reduce the ability of landlords from increasing rents. Uh, uh, and they've developed a formula, which I'm not going to get into, but uh, just understand that, you know, having a good idea as to uh, the revenues and where they come from is going to be very important, especially as you begin to prepare uh, your city budget, right? And this is one of those areas in terms of forecasting that is not an exact science. And so it, it's going to be somewhat challenging to figure out. 
And, and that's when the challenge for a finance director or a city treasurer is, you know, the projecting the potential revenue for a city. That sometimes it's it's a pretty safe bet. Other times uh, you have to look at models and, and try to figure out what's going to happen. And just like weather models, you may get three or four different models saying three or four different things. Um, so you really don't know what's going to happen until it starts raining, for example. Okay. So how might these sources be increased or decreased? So you can ask yourself that question and answering that question should help you in terms of trying to address citizens' concerns on holding the line or increasing um, or maintaining the same services and programs that you've used in previous years. Um, you need to understand that. Uh, if it's there, then you need to come up with some other reason why you're not going to continue the program. If it's not there, it's a little bit easier to argue against it. But nonetheless, um, these are tools that you can have to help you manage your revenue practices. Right? So again, where does it come from? Uh, how might these sources be increased or decreased? Sluggish economy might impact sales tax and their property taxes. What revenue sources? And you can look at that handout. Uh, that was uh, offered in our resources might be impacted by a sluggish economy. So when you look at the revenue sources for cities in Texas, you know, how might that be impacted by a sluggish economy? And then what's a community to do in, in terms of its tax base and in terms of, in terms of its revenue? Um, one of the things that happened in the recession in 2008 where a lot of people uh, had uh, homes with uh, balloon payments that were due and they couldn't make those balloon payments. So what happened was uh, you began to see a lot of evictions and a lot of vacant homes and that began to have an impact on local government because now you began to have squatters, uh, you began to have neighborhoods that uh, several homes were, fell into disrepair because nobody was taking care of them, nor were the banks. Some local governments and state governments stepped in and then required the banks or whoever held the title to maintain the property in a presentable manner because you actually still have people living in those neighborhoods, although a lot of the houses went into foreclosure. Um, so there's consequences to everything, but nonetheless, uh, it's important that you manage your revenue uh, practices and, and sources. And again, we can look at long term revenue stability, revenue policies, optimizing revenues from existing sources. Uh, and my example was again through uh, timely property tax collection. All right, so this is just a chart that shows average city revenues and expenses in 2013 for California cities uh, as compared to Texas. So you can look at where uh, Texas revenue comes from, city revenues come from, and then you can compare that to revenues from California. Uh, now, California relies heavily on taxes, specifically uh, personal income tax. So when the wealthy are doing great in California, uh, California has money. But when the economy does a downturn and wealthy people aren't making as much money on their investment returns, then California has experienced a considerable loss in terms of their taxes from personal income. Um, and that's something they've been struggling with in terms of, you know, how do you uh, minimize the, um, those type of taxes when um, they're no longer there. Uh, it's a constant. So, again, take a look at, I, I just posted this here as an informational thing, but you can take a look at the revenue sources for cities in California versus cities in Texas. Again, they're all going to be a little bit different. There are obviously some very similarities. And then you can look at typically how um local governments in california how they expend their money what are their expenses um, and you can take a look at at that and do some comparisons okay uh, so that's just that's just that part of it i just want to do that so again how might a hiccup in funding sources impact city operations a decrease in property taxes or decrease in sales tax so again look at these taxes and then figure out how it is that these could potentially impact uh, cities operating expenses. So California cities depend heavily on taxes and fees to finance operations. Uh, in California, they have Proposition 13, which was passed in the mid 1970s. Uh, but prior to Prop 13, property taxes constituted 57% of combined city and county revenues annually. So property taxes were a big chunk of California um, city and county revenues. In 2011, 2012, 
uh, this is way after Prop 13, but Prop 13 readjusted property taxes and what people had to pay uh, in terms of property taxes uh, for their houses. Uh, property tax represented only 8% of the average aggregate budget. So property tax revenue for cities fell considerably, as you can see, from 57% uh, to 8%. The bulk of funding now comes from service charges for public utilities and transit, sales taxes, property taxes, a variety of taxes and fees on hotels. So if anyone's been to Vegas lately, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, developers, uh, a lot of local governments now are requiring developers to pay for community parks, sidewalks, uh, an array of things. Um, and you have other businesses, uh, state and local federal agencies and bond monies. Those, those all contribute to it. But um, nonetheless, um, this just gives you some ideas to where a state such as California, how it collects revenue, and then of course that impacts cities. So you get an idea as to city revenues and then city expenses based on California prevailing law. Finally, I just want to spend a minute and talk about unfunded liabilities in local government because that is a huge thing. And I posted an article on the town in Illinois, I believe, and how they're trying to do with the unfunded liability um, associated with uh, pension funds for the public employees. Um, unfunded liabilities probably constitute the most hazardous type of debt that local government is experiencing. Now, unfunded liabilities refers to whatever city or county legally owes in future payments, but does not yet have the financial reserves to cover it. So historically, for example, California cities and counties have negotiated retirement and health care benefits in contracts with public employees such as firefighters and police. But some of those commitments have drained and continue to threaten public treasuries to the point of bankruptcy. Uh, generous contracts were based on optimistic projection of tax receipts and returns on investments, but those investments tanked along with the economy beginning in 2008. Um, and in California, uh, the first city to file for bankruptcy was Vallejo, California, which is about 80,000 people. Uh, and that's up in towards the Bay Area in California. Uh, soon, the cities of San Bernardino, Mammoth Lakes, and Stockton, California, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in 2012 in hopes of erasing soaring debt. To cover local government, to cover local bankrupt, government must raise taxes to pay its bills and curtail virtually all, and curtail virtually every service it provides to citizens as it charges higher fees. Crime rises as police force dwindles. The city's ability to borrow vanishes along with its good credit ratings. The roads become gutted with potholes and tourism, if that was an option, evaporates. The city's long-term debt is reduced through renegotiation of current labor contracts, yet the huge pension obligations remain. Now this week I posted two articles, uh, which are good examples of unfunded liabilities facing local government. Uh, and it's not just in California, but elsewhere. A lot of cities are beginning to under, understand that uh, retirement systems are going to be taking a bigger chunk out of their overall operating budget, so they're going to have to make up that money somewhere. Okay, so again, um, your discussion is talking about changing times and changing decision makings, and whether to hold the line in spending or whether you have the desire to continue with the same services and programs that your government has been providing all these past years. Um, my answer is that it's, uh, it's a crapshoot sometimes because you're really looking at um, trying to predict future revenues um, and what your expenditures might be. You're looking at short term forecasting versus medium range forecasting and trying to understand and get a better handle on the debt that's coming. Uh, so for example, I discussed briefly, but if, if your employees have a three year contract and this is the second year of their contract and you owe them a 5% pay raise, then obviously you need to figure out where that 5% is coming from, okay? So again, unfunded liabilities to me is local government's uh, worst nightmare right now. Uh, and it's not, it's it's all over the place. Um, it may be even in the town where you work and live. Um, and if that is an issue where you work or live, you know, please feel free to share it in your, your post this week, okay? That's it, guys. I hope it's been helpful. And I'm sorry about the late, but uh, I think this is pretty important stuff. So I will talk to you guys later and wishing you a great week. And I will see you in Brightspace. Bye.